Sorry to keep you waiting, sir, but his lordship has just telephoned. Unfortunately, he's been delayed and won't be able to show you around the collection personally. An incident with the Bentley, I understand. However, he suggests that I act as your guide until his return, so if you'd care to come this way, sir. I have to admit, sir, that over the years I've taken a particular interest in the collection myself. Interesting word, holofane. It's Greek, I believe, sir. Hollow and fainin. It means full of complete visibility, sir. Uh, after you, sir. You go in. As this is your first visit, may I suggest that you start with this Victorian gentleman here, sir. Professor Alexander Pelham Trotter. In the 1860s, he experimented with the use of prismatic glass refractors to improve the light distribution of gas mantles. Here's the very first refractor he made. It's mounted in a biscuit box lid, I believe. Most ingenious. The design principles that Professor Trotter developed led to the founding of Holofane in 1896. And just one year later, when Queen Victoria was celebrating her diamond jubilee, uh, the company was already well known for its church and domestic and street lighting. Public are paying daily thousands of pounds for gas and electricity for which they do not get a fair return in light. Would a man go for years allowing 25% to 50% of his gas to leak away and pay the full amount of his gas bills? Such a man does not exist. Yet millions place over their lights globes that do exactly the same thing, viz, absorb and destroy from 25% to 50% of the light. Of all the thousands of varieties of globes in existence, the Holofane system, based as it is on strictly scientific principles and optical laws, is the only one that gives, with a total absence of glare, the full return in illumination of all lights it covers. Oh yes, they were just as cost-conscious at the turn of the century as we are today. All Holofane's lighting used prismatic principles to make the most of the light, and it still does, even though lamps are much more powerful today. They made a tremendous variety of luminaires for all kinds of purposes. Some of the shapes were extremely complex, as you can see. Making the moulds and pressing the glass was an art in itself. Everything was done by hand, and even to press a medium-sized reflector for a street light needed a team of five men. A single pressing might need several charges of molten glass, and each charge had to be at exactly the same temperature, or the glass wouldn't blend thoroughly. Several tons of pressure had to be applied in order to form the piece. After pressing, a number of finishing operations were necessary. It was quite a time-consuming business, but the end product was very robust and had an extremely long life. Of course, even then, Holofane had an eye for the export markets. You'd find their lighting in some of the most unexpected places. At the Conference for Overseas Agents in 1930, over 24 countries were represented. This was taken outside the head office. Ah, now, the gentleman standing on the left it was one of the speakers at that conference, Mr. Rollo Gillespie Williams. And he was largely responsible for getting Holofane involved in quite a different world. Color lighting can now be harmonized with music in perfect accord to make the music interlude a feature attraction. The beauty and fascination of Holofane color lighting in close synchronization with organ or orchestra definitely raises the entertainment value of the whole program by psychological play on the emotions. 
a cordial invitation to visit the Hall of Fame Demonstration Theatre is extended to all bona fide inquirers. That brings back some memories, huh? I can tell you. But uh, when the uh, talk is really to hold, the days of cinema organs and coloured lighting were soon over. But luckily, Hall of Fame were never really diverted from their scientific approach. That's probably why they were entrusted with some of the most demanding lighting projects of the day. They became involved in some very historical events, too, sir. Lighting Westminster Abbey for the coronation of George VI in 1937. When the war started, Holofane's expertise was used to light some of the most vital and secret operations. They produced runway lights, too and they saw a good deal of use. The prismatic lenses were designed to take the weight of a landing aircraft. Many of them are still in service today. By this time, Holofane had become acknowledged experts, and whenever there was a particularly tricky problem, they were invariably called in. They even designed their own instruments to measure and calculate light levels more accurately. Ah, yes. After all the hardships of the war, it was about time we had something worth celebrating. Hall of Fame lit Westminster Abbey for the 1953 coronation, too. Since then, they've lit quite a number of other events, and you'll still find their lighting in some of the finest surroundings. But it's not all palaces and grand occasions. They've continued to secure some of the most demanding civil and industrial projects. The only common factor being that the lighting had to give the best possible performance. For example, they lit the tornado assembly lines for British aerospace. And you can imagine the standards required to assemble such a magnificent machine. Quite extraordinary, isn't it, sir? From the age of Queen Victoria to the age of high technology. And Holofane is still leading the field. Of course, there's much more to the collection. We've only seen a tiny fraction of it. Sir. For example... Uh, that must be his lordship, sir. If you'll excuse me, sir, I'd better attend to him. But uh, please, do carry on browsing. You'll find some quite fascinating material in the display cases. Much of it dates back to the early part of the century. Let us...